thank you so much for the introduction and thank you for inviting me and in providing me with this opportunity to share with you some of my experiences and thoughts about how it's it's been in life for me and my family living with HD. Uh, and I hope we can have some kind of interaction here between us so, so we can have some um, ideas and other experiences maybe also brought up because I learn something every day. I meet other family members, honestly, so. Yeah, absolutely. And it's a good reminder to tell people that they can ask questions through the chat and, and we can put those to you, Astrid, as, as the evening goes on. Um, and yeah, it's it's great to have you um, with us this evening. It's, it's a significant day for Huntington's today. It's the HD Gratitude Day. Um, and that's an, a very significant day, I suppose, for the global Huntington's community. Um, would you mind telling yeah. us a bit about that? Really, it was a it was a coincidence. I think that we that we landed on this day, but it's, yeah. it fitted so nicely because it's really a, a wonderful campaign going on uh, on in the social media everywhere in the in the community to remind us about that day uh, thirty years ago when a group of scientists uh, led by I think it was Nancy Wexler. Uh, publicated uh, an article about that they had identified the Huntington gene, which was a major thing, uh, really. They had been working so hard uh, for so long to achieve that. But what's really the Gratitude Day um, essence is that we are paying our uh, thanks to all the family members in Venezuela who donated their blood samples to make it possible for the researchers to, to find the gene finally, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> and and I guess it has made so many things possible, like being able to do a predictive test and, you know, progress research and all of that as well. It's 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 very significant. Um, and I, I know that people probably know you through your work with the European Huntington's Association, but I'm not sure how many people will know about your personal connection to Huntington's. Do you mind sharing your experiences with us? No, not at all. Not at all. I think uh, that's where I come from. And that's the background for all my commitment and, and, and my participation in the community today is because uh, this is in my family. And, and that does something to you uh, throughout your the whole lifespan from when you learn about this. So I was thinking maybe I should share screen because I have some photos so I can show. Yeah, that would be lovely. Talk a little bit about um, let me see here, share screen. Oh, and then I was there, okay. I wanted to stop share, sorry, I was wrong photo for the start. I will fix that first and then I can do it. Okay, here, from beginning and why is that not from the beginning here? Sorry for this. Here we go. We need to start with this with the beginning, don't we? Yes, we do. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, can you see the slideshow now? Yes, now we can yeah. see it in, in screen mode. So this is me in 1962. I was born a long time ago. Very cute. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I love this photo because here my mother is looking at me uh, being a small baby and she smiles. Uh, it's one of the few photos I have, or the only one, basically, because right after I was born as child number four uh, in a row, so uh, she was busy there for for quite some years, um, and she went into deep depression right after having me. So actually, it was my grandmother who came staying with us and took care of me from when I was really, really small for several months. But uh, here it seems that she has recovered from that. But my mother was suffering from severe depressions from time to time uh, since she was uh, very, very young in life. And if that had something to do with Huntington's disease, we don't know, of course, but, but it may very well be due to the hard circumstances with her father being sick, but, but also maybe it was a very early symptom of HD itself in, in her. Mm -hmm. But... Um, and here we are a couple of years later. Um, as you can see, we were a bunch of kids and uh, one of them is my cousin. So she had four at the time here. Um, and she was behaving, I would say, perfectly normal. She was managing this big family and she was doing everything at home, her duties as a, as a housewife. And, um, and we couldn't really put a finger on anything being wrong. Mm. But what was really strange was that her father was sick very uh, you could really see it we visited them 
quite frequently, but nobody talked about what it was he was suffering from or what was wrong with him, because it was not only him, it was also his sisters being around and, and showing a lot of motor symptoms and, and clearly where something was wrong, and it was never mentioned, right. which is strange, but it happens, and I think it still happens in families. And as a child, you just understand, you don't ask. Mm. You, you just don't ask about it because it's a taboo you sense that this is a taboo mm -hmm. so even if ht was really around us in in my in my grandfather's and his family and 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 that it, it was never a a topic that was discussed or touched upon at all and um as time went by here we are around 10 years later so i think here i'm yeah maybe i'm 10 years old or 11 or 12 Anyway, here my mother is starting to show uh, symptoms and it there are some subtle, maybe some motor patterns that change it, changes, but it was really her, her mood swings and her personality that changed. She became much more unreasonable and easy annoyed and, and or easy. Uh, she was really crying a lot for things that we couldn't understand why the outbursts and these strong emotions and I wrote in my diary actually around this time that my mother is crazy oh. my mother is crazy but we didn't understand because still it wasn't talked about and, and that's also how we as a family coped here I mean we were we were four and uh, five siblings and we had just to cope with this individually because we couldn't share it so I had, luckily, I had a couple of very good friends I could share with and be, you know, share my frustration and talk about what was happening at home uh, to ventilate it out. Uh, but never, never inside the family. No, you didn't talk to your siblings either? No. No. no never. We had these rows, we had these, you know, emotional kind of almost breakdowns from my mm. mother and, and she uh, a little bit later in, in time she also started to say that she wanted to kill herself she could come in full of tears and said I will go and drown myself oh. and uh, and we were just apathetic in a way uh, and and waiting for it to pass I think because that it, it usually or it always passed after a, some time it right. could be going on for several hours, but but then she calmed down and it was kind of forgotten, never talked about again. So that's really how that childhood went by. And, and um, actually also, how did it affect my life? Because I had to stay with it uh, because I lived at home, of course, but it was really hard and we had a lot of frictions between us. I wanted to make my choices in terms of education. She wanted to influence me in ways. I mean, it's normal for parents to want to influence you, but yeah. it was it was kind of unreasonable. And we couldn't have good discussions about why I wanted to, to choose what I wanted to. And it just ended up in rows and and, and tears and and you know, slamming doors. So it was it was kind of tough. And my sister and brother, the oldest, they left house uh, and moved away as soon as they could. Mm. So uh, you're the youngest. And you're I was the second one. youngest. My brother there, the little one on the on the lap of his oldest brother, the older brother was the youngest. Okay. And he was the one that was left with my mother at the end. Because what I did, you see, I couldn't find it uh, because this is my mother. Uh, 10 years later, in 82. And here she's clearly having also quite a lot of motor symptoms. Those of you who know HD well can maybe see from her posture that she's kind of holding herself because her arms wants to, you know, to, to move around and, and she puts on her scarf so she can kind of hide the, uh, the, um, the movements and make sense of them. But this was my wedding. So I was 20 years old. And I'm married. I couldn't, I'm sorry, I was looking for a wedding photo, but I couldn't find it because <laughs> it was a very short marriage. I married a nice man, but he was not the right man for me at all. And I've been thinking so many times afterwards, why did you marry him? Why did you marry him? And you know, the, the answer I had come up with to myself was that I needed a good excuse to move out of that house. Yeah. 
And when you marry, of course, you are excused. You have to, <laughs> to live with your husband. So I could leave the home and my mother clearly being sick uh, and, and feel a little bit better. Unfortunately, that was, as I said, the, the wrong man. So I divorced after just a year and a half, honestly. Uh, but um, yeah, that, so that's just one example of how how we, without really knowing, are so much affected about what's going on. Yeah, absolutely. And and then I guess you know after that, how how did it influence your relationships? Your kind of yeah, because uh, maybe just one year before this. When I was 19, my mother was diagnosed. Finally, she was diagnosed. Because my one, one relative in our family, a doctor, he told my father, you know what? I think, uh, I think uh, Tove is her name, has Huntington's disease. And then my father took her to a, to a specialist in Oslo, in the capital of Norway, and had her diagnosed with Huntington's disease based on her family story and her symptoms. She was clearly displaying all the symptoms, you, you know, nice. uh, in, in HD. And luckily then they came home and my father gathered us, the siblings, and told us. I know many parents struggle a lot to tell. My mother didn't say anything, but my father took the responsibility and shared this information with us. So from the age I was 19, I learned that it was Huntington's disease. And I had understood because of my grandfather and his sisters and uh, also, you know, showing the same symptoms earlier that it had to be something hereditary. Mm. But obviously I didn't know what. So for me to have her, her diagnosed known was really a, a comfort because I could understand her unreasonable behavior. Uh, and actually, I felt a very strong um, kind of, I could forgive her. <laughs> I could forgive her for the hard time we had been through because I realized that she couldn't help it. It was the disease who had caused all these uh, you know, mood swings and, and things that we have been through. So for me, it was a, really a good thing in relation to my mother. But of course, it was a hard thing in terms of dealing with my own risk. Yes. But that also brought us to a point where we as siblings were sharing, talking about HD for the first time uh, and talking about that being at risk. And, and we were we were very open with each other for, for many years, actually, which was also which was also really good and, and helping me. That That's very interesting, isn't it? That when you didn't know, you weren't open, but when you did, you were able to be more open about it. We were able to be, my mother never were able to discuss or talk to us about it. She never kind of openly admitted that she had been diagnosed. But for us, between our siblings, it was it was really um, a big help. Yes, and yeah. I'm so grateful for that, that we were informed uh, at the time. Mm. And then uh, after my divorce, I met this man who is also currently my husband, <laughs> has been for many, many years, as you can tell from the photo. <laughs> um, so, um, and we met at, jo at, the, at uh, a school where we both worked. Uh, so we were colleagues uh, and I, um, we became very good friends and I told him about HD and my risk as a friend. Okay. So I think that was easier because if we have started out as, you know, uh, partners, uh, it would maybe have been harder for me to know how and when could I tell and share. Mm. And perhaps daunting for him as well. Yeah, yeah. Before because he knew. Found it, yeah, because he found it. I mean, I talked a lot about it and, and he found it interesting, <laughs> if I may say so. I mean, it was... Yeah, he understood it was hard, but still it was uh, kind of abstract mm. because I'm being at risk, you, you can't see it. It's just, you know, talking about your emotions and what may come in the future. And of course, he did see my mother uh, every now and then when we went visit. But still it was, I mean, she was so much older and it was, you know, when you're young, you 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 think time is, the future is is far ahead. So it was kind of distant and, and a little bit abstract. Uh, but we shared it. So we have always been open about uh, 
about HD and and how how we could could deal with it. But he was really taking it from a very positive standpoint and thinking, no, this we will deal with it when it comes, if it comes. And and now we live now, and and we will. And we were very much in love, so that was, of course, a nice thing as well for our relationship. So, uh, um, but then uh, after a while, we stayed together and, and moved in together. And um, and after a few years, he didn't want to be a father. He said okay. to me, "No, my father was not a good father. I don't think I will be a good father." So he said, "No, no, I I, I don't think we should do that." But after a while. I felt really strongly that I wanted children. That was kind of, I don't know, it's hard to explain. It was just in me. Yeah. I really wanted that to happen. Okay. Yeah. And I, I I mean, I knew about the risk. And at that time, you couldn't, uh, you couldn't do confirmative genetic testing, but you could do a chromosome test, which was 80 or I think 80, between 80 and 90% certainty. Uh, so you could get a strong indication whether you would get it or not, but it was not 100% as it as it became after 93. Um, but I didn't want to do that. And for me, coping with the risk was really, um, what I did was that I, I was hoping for the best, of course, fearing that I had the gene and, and would develop the disease, but I was hope, strongly hoping for the best. And I also really involved in the in the association and the community in Norway and kept myself informed. So I also had strong faith and belief in research, yeah. making the advantage, uh, advances and, and, and that they would, uh, you know, come up with treatments for HD in my lifetime. Yeah. That was a strong belief. So... You convinced your good husband to have children or was yes, that Yes, I did. I did, Patricia. It was a long process. And actually, I was feeling so strongly about it that after six years, I said to him, do you know what? If you don't want children, we have to split up. I said it more or less as straight out as that. And then he said, OK. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so... so uh, so we did we did uh, go ahead and we were lucky so we had two really really wonderful girls. Oh. Yes. <laughs> and they are just there's one year and a half between them. And and they were such uh, such a gift and and so precious to us and and it was amazing to have them. But what really happened was that once he became a father Sven Olaf, my husband, started to um, to be much more concerned and worried about HD. Okay. Because of the, I don't know, I mean, the responsibility of being a parent and the perspective of maybe he had to manage, you know, if I got sick. Uh, so he started to develop a lot of anxiety and worry and uh, about HD, which he hadn't had before. And did you think, do you think looking back that he had more anxiety perhaps than you had around that? Yes, actually, I think. And this, this we couldn't share. Right. He could never share his worry and his thoughts about this with me. That was not possible, which looking back uh, surprised me a bit. But I can also understand it because he wanted to protect me also by not sharing, huh? Mm. So, so, um, and I shared a little bit about my anxiety because sometimes when you experience, you lose things or forget things or that you are, it's, it's symptoms, it's starting, um, which came and went away again so for me all the time I was at risk. So, so I shared a little bit about that, but he never could share anything about his worry. And actually he became so worried that he thought that uh, one of the girls were, were having uh, signs of juvenile Huntington's disease. He was really so scared, so scared. And it was taking over a lot of him. And, and I couldn't understand what was going on in him when, when, you know, when we had a quarrel, like all couples have, yes. I guess, at least. <laughs> And he was sure, oh, my God, now she's unreasonable. She's showing, you know, this is a symptom. Uh -huh. Yeah. And and that made it much worse, of course. Too. Yes. There was something there, and it, I could never understand what it was. Uh, but that was that 
he he thought this will be okay. Now it's happening because he never thought it was something with him that could make me annoying. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, um, but anyway, you deal with your everyday life as as we all do, and there are good days and and not so good days. But uh, but um, we came to a point, and the girls grew older. And uh, when this, the, uh, the oldest one, she never really wanted to talk so much about HD uh, because I wanted to talk to them. And, you know, when they were, I can maybe go back because when they were a little bit older than this, I wanted to tell them about HD. And Sven Olaf said, no, you should not, you shouldn't. But I said, yes, I have to, because I had a really strong uh, opinion that they had the right to know. And they came with me for quite some years and visited my mother, who was in a care home for many, many years. So they saw their grandmother uh, being yeah. ill. And one day I just told them, even if Sven Olaf didn't agree, I, I just told them they were, I don't know, six, seven years old, uh, because um, I, I thought that was needed. Uh, told them about their grandmother being sick by a, a disease called Huntington's disease. And they immediately asked me, can you get it? Oh. And I said, yes, I can get it, but I don't think I don't have it now. And I don't know if I will have it. But I'm I'm fine now. Yeah. So that's how they, they learned about it at an early stage in life. And they they dealt with it differently. So so Yannicke, the oldest one, she didn't really want to talk about it uh, much. But the, the other one, um, I have her here, Mike, and she was much more open and kind of maybe at ease with it because she right. looked at me and she thought my mother is fine it's okay I don't need to worry yet that was her main thought of yeah. course she had some concern I'm sure but but she was more at ease with it while Yannick had more concern and worry but she didn't share it yeah again it's really hard to share this fear between family members because we want to protect each other yeah, yeah. And it, yeah. I know it's a, a difficult decision as to when to tell children and how to tell. And, you know, yeah. I know sometimes that can cause disharmony, I suppose, when one parent wants to and another parent doesn't. It can be difficult. It can be. And I don't know if it, that's a pattern, but I think maybe the one who is, I don't know, living with it is more, uh, I mean, I had to come to terms with it. And I, I really wanted them to know while Sven Olaf, who was married into this in a way, he didn't want them. He wanted to protect them and, and keep them, you know, away from it as long as possible. Mm. Uh, but I still think it was the right thing to tell them early so they could grow into it as well as part of the life because you can't really hide these things. And there is never a, a right time. Yeah. You just have to jump into it one way or another, I think. Um, but when when Yannicke, when this girl was when she was seventeen and a little bit more, and she came home, home drunk one evening, and she was uh, and she said to me, "I will do the test. I need to know." And for me, that was oh, oh my gosh! And she also said to me, "I will not tell you the result," because she knew that if she tested with the and and learned that she had the antigen gene, she had tested me as well. Yeah. So she said that, no, I will not tell you about the result. Uh, and then I immediately said, no, 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 I will do the test. You should, this burden cannot be on you. I will yeah. do the test, Janneke. So the day after I picked up the phone and called a geneticist, I know doing this procedures. And I said to her, uh, I need to test. And I was 48 at the time. So I was really an adult person. And I realized yeah. that if I will be sick, it will happen soon, and I should. We should prepare. And did you feel a conflict? I suppose maybe being, you know, having to decide to do it when you hadn't thought about it up to that stage. Yeah, for me, that living with a risk, as I said, had been a coping strategy, a very active coping strategy, because I hoped so much for the best mm. um, and did the best out of my life. I managed the fear in a way, mm. uh, in a way that didn't give me a bad life. I mean, I, so, uh, but uh, on the other hand, when Yannick said, I need to know, I, I felt immediately it was the right thing for me to do. 
So I never doubted it was the right thing throughout that three month period from when you start the process until you get the, the, the result. But it was the most scariest months of my time. I was like a, a small child when you fear, you know, the ghosts under your bed or the bad man in the closet. It, it was yeah. really that kind of fear, honestly. It was really that kind of fear. Um, but I never doubted I should do it. And when we got into the room to get the to re get the result, the geneticist told me right away, you don't have it. And I just became still. I don't know what happened, you know. Okay, okay. I had feared the worst, but I had thought intellectually that you you seem to be okay. You are probably okay. But my husband, he was screaming like a baboon. He was really <laughs> almost jumping out of the window because he was on the on the opposite side. He was convinced and fully prepared to receive a bad uh, result and, and that I had Huntington's disease or the gene. So, yeah, we were two extremes there, one silent and one jumping around, really screaming. So um, so that was, uh, yeah, very special, of course. And um, I, I see a question there, sorry to yeah. demonstrate, there's a question in the chat. Um, you and your siblings continue to talk about Huntington's as you, you know, started your families and... That's a very good uh, question. I think I would stop share because now I've, I've come to the end of my photos. So I think that's that's good. I need to show Mike and they're so nice. So happy for yeah. <laughs> Yeah, did we continue to talk about it? Uh, yes, we did. We did. When I had got my test result, I hadn't shared with my siblings before I did it because I needed to to keep it, I don't know, for for, for the in, inner family. Uh, and my husband was was with me uh, during the process. But um, but when I had the result, uh, it took me a little while, so some weeks before I... Uh, uh, yeah, took the courage to tell them, which was scary mm. for me. Um, yeah. But they were really very happy for me, all of them, and and um, and and that was, of course, good to experience. And I think we are we are quite kind of I don't know. Um, no, I don't think any of us felt that since I had tested, I had taken one of the good cards out okay. of the family, so they had lower. Uh, or, yeah, lower probability of being lucky as well, because um, I, don't, I don't think so anyway. It was never said anything that could could be like that. But what was really sad also and strange was that I experienced that um, I have a sister and she's just one year older than me. So we are really, really kind of pseudo twins in a way. Uh, and she is of this, um, she has autism, but she's quite well functioning and she was sad. And she was sad when I had tested and I couldn't really understand why, but she was sad because we were no longer in the same boat. Uh, yeah. We were no longer at risk together. Together. Yeah. And that was quite strong, honestly, to experience. Uh, and still is in a way. We're not in the same boat anymore. So you step out of that position and you lose mm. something. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. But we continued to talk about HD between us as siblings until my older sister uh, really started to show symptoms. Then it became more and more difficult. So when symptoms occurred, it was difficult. I was my, I able to, with my youngest brother, he developed symptoms quite early in life and I was there to support him. And he, he was more open and could share and talk about it and, and receive support and help but my older sister she sh shut down and didn't want to talk about it i see another question there in the chat astri uh, how did testing negative change you as a person you spoke about maybe the dynamics changed a little bit but for you yourself did you feel that you changed in some way yeah you do change you do change. And I think a, a very good friend of mine in the community, she says, doing the genetic test doesn't inform you. It transforms you. And it really does, for both results, it, it, it changes you. Um, and it took a long time 
to kind of uh, understand the changes because um, they are so subtle in a way. It was, of course, instantly wonderful to come home and tell the children that they were safe, that they would not develop Huntington's disease. That was amazing, of course. But for myself, very little change from one day to another in terms of you could you when you think about people doing this test and get the good result or win the lottery all trouble disappear in from one day to another and life becomes just a walk in the park and that's not the case at all um and 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 there are so many mixed emotions and and things that happens and and for me, it took many years, at least five years, before I really stopped looking for symptoms in myself. Really? Yeah, a long, long time. And maybe as long before I realized, oh, my gosh, I am starting to envision myself getting old. I had never done that. I wasn't aware of that. I never did that, being at risk, but I didn't. So slowly we start, of course, I got older as well, but slowly we started to speak about me and my husband about uh, getting old together and, and planning for something mm -hmm. way ahead in time. And we had never done that before. That was also really strange to, to experience. And of course, it changed your identity. Uh, but for me, I, I, I chose to remain in the community that has always been really important for me and and I don't know if I'm, if I'm paying back, but I'm, at least I'm trying to do my best to contribute to to help the yeah. people and yeah, and do my best. Mm. And and did did you feel guilty at all when you tested negative, and you know when your siblings started to show symptoms? Did that make you feel guilty at all, or? No, actually, I have never felt guilt myself. Mm -hmm. uh, honestly, I've been lucky in that way because I understand many people really strongly feel about that guilt. Uh, I haven't. I haven't. I feel extremely lucky. Yeah. Now when I go see my sister, I mean, my brother passed away some years ago, uh, uh, being in the middle stage of Huntington's, um, and he passed away with a heart attack, so... So, but my sister is in a very late stage and in a care home and I go see her and I know could just as well has been me. Uh, but I just feel very, very grateful. I don't feel guilt for, for not being in her place uh, because it's not up to me. So yeah, <laughs> it's absolutely. a luxury of life. So I don't take any, any of the blame, so to speak, for the others. Not so happy destiny in a way, but um, yeah, no. That's me. Yeah, that's that's good. <laughs> it is, uh, and I know that it it can be very difficult for people who test negative that they somehow perhaps feel some guilt around that, which is very Absolutely. unfortunate because you know people still have a lot to deal with, and it's not like you truly escape, you know. So, um, but I I know the Huntington's Disease Youth Organization do a lot of work with younger people, especially around predictive testing and all of that. And, and I know that there was a conference at the weekend and I believe you were at it. Um, yes, it was amazing in Glasgow, HD Youth Organization. Yeah. Uh, and yes, actually that's, I think it's the first time I, I've been in a group where we all had tested negative ah. for HD. And I realized that, and most, uh, all the others told about guilt or really depression and a lot of the uh, of mixed emotions and trouble really receiving and dealing with that result as well yeah so that's that's common but for me it has been um, it hasn't been a big problem it's 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 costs of course um yeah and but not not like that no no but but you found the conference very positive I believe it was. It was. It's amazing. Uh, and it was the first really international, at least, conference where people were meeting face to face after the pandemic. So that and people came in from all over the world, really, more or less, at least. And it was it was amazing to be there. And and the and mostly young people, of course, and they are many of them. And most of them are so open and willing to share and I think that can be tough of course mm. and it, it's quite hard on me also to see these young people struggle as they do you want to you know lead them by the hand and really 
support them and you can't be anything else than just be there and listen and 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 you know express your yeah about yourself as well but it's amazing they are they are really uh, so many of them so so strong and so wonderful people and honestly the most wonderful people i know in the world come from the hd community and they are gene negative or have huntington's disease and they are amazing people so mm. They have all uh, the place in the world to be here and, and among us. And uh, and we have to fight this and, and deal with it as best as we can together. Yeah, absolutely. There's some really dynamic people within yes. HDO. Yes. And, and, and I think the good thing is for people who didn't make the conference, I'm, I'm sure that there will be sessions recorded. I know they did from previous occasions. Yes. So. There will be many of the sessions made available, uh, recorded. Um, and many different and and sessions with interesting topics for family members affected, you know, and um, and really um, a lot of the volunteers and the HD ambassadors, as they are called, uh, sharing from their you know experience and their thoughts, and it's amazing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I know there's some more questions here, um, but I, maybe before I, I we get to those questions, I. I would like you to maybe share some of your work with the European Huntington's Association, Huntington Association. It's it's obviously a very important organization in trying to advance research and um, promote, I suppose, involvement with families as well. Would you mind talking a bit about your work? Yeah, absolutely. Because I, I came from the Norwegian Association, so I joined them as soon as we learned about HD. And then uh, because I'm really a, a person who tends to get engaged, I, I was elected also president for that as association, which I was for 10 years. And throughout that period of time, I realized that we have to work, you know, across borders to learn from each other and to exchange experience and to, to support the research and, and to really, you know, move the field forward. So that's how I got in touch with the European Association and, and got involved there from 2010. And I've been the president since 2016. Uh, and it's really a, a wonderful um, association where basically all the associations in Europe are, are a member of that community. And we share a lot. We share a lot of information and resources and contacts and we exchange, you know, and and we uh, jointly support uh, research in whatever capacity we can to move the field forward as fast as possible. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I might uh, just, um, before we start asking questions, um, what, what are your kind of main hopes for the future, Astrid, around, uh, you know, the progression of research and all of that? There are many, I have many hopes and I have high expectations and, and yeah, for sure the future will be much better than the past. Yeah, that's, really that's true. Clear, <laughs> clear message. And, you know, just around the corner in, in maybe just one month time, we will know the results from the, the proof HD uh, phase three study done by Prilenia. And I, I don't pray because I'm not a religious, but, uh, but I almost pray for that to be a positive result in some capacity, at least, so we can have the first medicine approved for HD, specifically developed for HD and and maybe if it's just a minor help, it's a help, but it 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 will mean yeah. a lot to so yes. many. Yeah. yeah, and I guess you know we have to um, think about you know even all the information we now know about Huntington's that it can make a huge difference in in people's quality of life and in delaying symptoms. You know, to be as healthy and as engaged as possible. I suppose all of Absolutely. those. Absolutely. Absolutely. And to so take care of yourself and, and find a way, a balance to and, and ways to cope with yeah. the stress and the fear that comes with this disease. That's inevitable. You have to confront yourself with it, but you have to deal with it. And we have different strategies and and and, mm -hmm. and ways to do that. So you need to find your way and 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 deal with it and, and be kind to yourself, honestly. <laughs> be kind to yourself and uh, and enjoy the good aspects and deal with the the, the better aspects and 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 for me it's been an enormous support to be part of the community it's so therapeutic still honestly yeah to other family members and and exchange experience with and thoughts with them yeah yeah well we really appreciate the work you do to advance 
treatments and um, awareness, I suppose, is such a big thing as well, and, and education around. Um, yes, I really, I really strongly believe that that knowing is empowering. We need to empower ourselves through knowing, uh, and I, at different levels, because we are different people with with you know different preferences. But, but again, for me to to know about the ongoing research and to to nourish my hope through that has been also a way of coping. Um, so so that's been um, an important that is an important mission for for uh, the European Huntington Association to to be the translator of from the science into the lay language uh, because they you know they use a lot of terminology which is hard to understand so we try to make it as easy available as possible the main points from that ongoing things and and also to translate into other european languages because there are many language barriers obviously so we want as many as possible to have access to information in their own language. Yeah. I might just um, go through some of the, the questions. Um, you may have answered, I suppose, the, the changes you've seen in the community and, and how, it cope, how it copes, um, you yeah. know, for sure, good. there are changes happening. I mean, more people are open about the disease, which is good. And which is why I, I am so happy for you inviting me to do this uh, webinar, for instance, because it's really important that the different stories are told openly because we need to fight the stigma and yeah. shame because there is so much shame and and, and fear in our in 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 families and and we need to fight that we we have nothing to be ashamed of it's a disease it's nobody's fault it's happening to us we have to deal with it and and that's really it we we can't hide because then we are invisible yeah so that's and really important yeah there's another interesting question um when you were at risk, did it affect other choices, like your career or plans for the future? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, the way I dealt with it was really uh, to look at the glass as half full. So I know we are, maybe also have different personalities there. So some people have... Uh, have more a tendency to see it as half empty and I have an easier tendency to see it as half full but it was also an active choice I was well at the time when I started my education I was well at the time when we formed the family and had children and I thought really that my life was worthwhile living and I wanted to do so it didn't affect me negatively that I denied myself opportunities. But mm. one thing I did at a point in when I was in my 40s and I had a very, very stressful job and I started to show symptoms of I maybe thought, oh, my gosh, this is Huntington's disease. I double booked the appointments. I forgot things. <laughs> I, you know, we all do that. Is. <laughs> yes, exactly. And I thought. I can't continue it in this job. I have to take care of myself. I have to leave to find something less uh, stressful. Uh, so that was one choice I did, but that was a good choice to make you, yeah. despite the Huntington risk, because it was really stressful. But yeah, but otherwise uh, we took up a mortgage to buy our house and we, we kind of, we were never ir irresponsible, but uh, I chose to bet on life or to be able to to live my best and and also we did a, an agreement me and my husband at some point when the children were about 10 12 years old we wrote an agreement that we put in a, in a lawyer's you know um, drawer uh, where we agreed that if I was diagnosed he should take the responsibility and have the you know uh, what's it the English term to to really be in, in part of attorney or yes in charge of the children Oh, because right. yeah, because I didn't want myself to to become sick and and do things not good for them because you lose some capacity to understand their needs. So that's that's the thing we did. Yeah, yeah. I need to put on my glasses now. <laughs> yeah. um, so an another uh, question here. Um, before my question, thank you so much for this webinar. Uh, my boyfriend's mother has HD. 
he doesn't want to do the genetic test and the subject in general is very hard for him to talk about and to deal with. <clears throat> it feels very hard to me to know the best way to act in all this scenario. I'm uh, that type of person that seeks for information to find reassurance and to feel prepared. My boyfriend is different and has a posture of avoidance. I'm a social worker, so I've been helping him about some stuff like social benefits he can ask for his mother, etc. But it's not easy for me to manage my position. Uh, how can I help him be supportive and at the same time not to be hard on him? Yeah, wow. That's a very, very good question. Or, or uh, yeah. what's described here, I think a lot of partners experience yeah. the same. Uh, it's easy to think that one should test because you can, uh, because you want to be reassured. I can I can perfectly well understand that, but it's impossible to push or impose that choice on somebody because he has your boyfriend has to be ready to deal with the result regardless of being good or bad. So you can't push him really, and he is dealing with it. And I think. You can say avoidance or or to really to to you know to I can't remember the the, the scientific way of, of of saying this, but you have to forget it to some extent as well. Mm. Cope. That's yeah. a way to cope. It's a coping strategy, so it can be a, a good way in, in to some extent at least. You need to find the balance, so so not completely in neglect, but but still we have to to forget it sometimes and and deal with it and. I can't really give you, give you a good advice because he has to find his way and you have to find your way as well as the partner. So you have to find out, can I live with this uncertainty or how can we make some way forward together to live with the uncertainty? Because even if he tested and knew he would have, he had the Huntington gene, there's so much uncertainty. When, <clears throat> how will it happen? It can be in 20, 30 years time if he's a young person. So you never get rid of the uncertainty, even with, a, of course, if you get a good result, you, you're you off the hook, so to speak. But yeah, no, it's, it's, uh, it's not easy. But the person that uh, is at risk have to find the way themselves. They have to do it for themselves because you're the one that has to live with the result. Nobody else, yeah, in a yeah. way. Yeah. Sure. Uh, another question here, um, and this might relate to something at the time, so apologies to the person who asked, but were there ever family appointments instead of individual appointments? I presume that's around genetic testing. If I had an individual appointment? Were there ever family appointments instead of individual appointments? That might relate to genetic testing, I, I, you know, when you were speaking about um, your daughter maybe wanting to find out. I, uh, I, I'm yeah, not sure. Uh, yes, I, the, the opportunity is here in, in Norway. There, There is the opportunity. If I had wanted to take her, my daughter, just for a genetic consultation together, we could have done it. Okay. I went alone the first and the second time, and then I brought my husband for the for the for the last one when I got the result. Yeah, yeah. But we could have, we could have gone the. Uh, I could have invited, or, or or she could have contacted as well, and and had an appointment for just to discuss. So that opportunity is there. It wouldn't be recommended, I suppose, for two people to get their results at the same time from a family because I know in Ireland it's not recommended to do that that it should be very much an individual decision. That's my opinion, uh, because you are the only one who's going to live with the results. So yeah. regardless of what your siblings or your partner, or sorry to say, it's a little bit harsh, but but regardless of what they want to do, and, and I know siblings sometimes test simultaneously, more or less, or at mm. the same time, and, and they are okay with it. But but for me, it was definitely the right thing to deal with this, with just my internal kind of closest family. and. Um, and that was enough, honestly, yeah. Yeah. Um, so another question is, um, do you feel extra responsibility to your siblings? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> yes, in a way. As I said, for my younger brother, he was six years younger than me. I became his uh, main point of support person when things happened. I was there when he was diagnosed. I was helping him 
get the, some kind of home services and support. I was the one driving that when he had to move into a, a special apartment to get more help. Um, so, so I re and I bought him food, and because he was wasting his money on beer and smoke, honestly. So, um, <laughs> yes, I did take a lot of responsibility. When my older sister got sick at a later point, I said to myself, I can't. I can't anymore. I'm sorry. She had a husband at the time. They got divorced. But I said, not directly to him, but I said to myself, I, I can't take the same role. I, 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 I don't have the strength to it, honestly. So yeah. I had to, I, I, and I, th I think I'm a little bit cynical and I had to be to take care of myself and deal with my own things and my daughters or our daughters and, and relationship and everything. So I couldn't, I couldn't be there for her as, as I don't know if I should, but I could maybe potentially done more, but I, I, I couldn't. Mm. Yep. So, yeah. And I know some some woman came up to me. She has a sister being very sick, and she said, "Astri, do I have a right to to prioritize things in my own life?" And I said, "Yes, you have. Mm -hmm. We have the right to live, and we have to find again the balance of what we can do and what we have to say sorry. Somebody else have to do it because yeah. you are so into it yourself. You know, with your own risk, it's so it's so much harder than." just yeah. normal disease helping somebody through it of course it's affecting you much more strong than that so yeah and it is a balance isn't it i mean you know life in general is a balance and i think people have to look after themselves perhaps in that way and and see that it is a balance it is it is and they had a very good session unfortunately i couldn't attend it but it was about self care at the youth of the conference last weekend uh, self care is not just a good thing it's a needed thing take care mm -hmm. of yourself yeah yeah um so another question Does your role give you insight into which countries in europe have the best systems in place to support hd families that's a bit hard to say because it's very there are great variations and some countries stand out with more good care like i think scotland and and i don't know uk and certainly the netherlands and belgium and have a, a lot of good centers providing care for different stages of the disease so so there are some countries standing out we have some good centers also here in norway where i live but i experience in all countries there are family members who lack support or don't know really where to turn to. And, and that's why the associations and the community is so extremely important everywhere to help guide people through the system and, and see if they can, yeah, yeah. The, get the support they need. Mm. Yeah. And I guess peer support as well. You know, people, families learn a lot from each other also. It's really, it's, it's, it's for me, it was a life changer when we learned about HD. My mother had HD. I was 19 years old and the association organized a seminar. We went for a weekend and I met others in the same situation. You know what? It was so therapeutic. It made my life different mm -hmm. from that moment. I'm sure. It was amazing. So somebody else has asked, have you ever come across HD caused by a mutation as this is what caused our son's HD? Yes. So it, a kind of a new incident, yeah. none of the parents have it. Mm -hmm. Yes, that happens. And um, and it actually happens maybe as in as much as 10% of all cases, honestly. Before, we thought the mother had been, you know, out with the postman or something, <laughs> uh, but no. It happens and it's more frequent when, than we used to think uh, because genes change. Mm -hmm. So they mutate. That's kind of the no normal way to, to of ev evolvement. Uh, uh, so, yes, that happens. And I've heard several cases. Yeah. Yeah. Another question here is how far is this medication you said could be available to patients with HD? I guess that's referring to the, the research results that you were talking about. Um, yeah. 
So the, the trial I was talking about is called Proof HD, and it will be ended. It's it's finalizing these days, and they have said that they will publish the result uh, within the next month or two at least. So very soon, really. And if there is a positive result, so they say that the trial has demonstrated that this medicine has some effect, they will apply for approval with the European Medicine Agency and maybe in the United States, I don't know, hopefully uh, broadly. And if it is approved, uh, which is hopefully will take not too long because it's an orphan drug. So it's it's for a rare disease and they have been promised a, a, a rapid row or rapid procedure, but we don't know how rapid, but some months. So if we are lucky, uh, before the end of this year, we have a drug approved, and then it's up to the different healthcare systems to decide on whether to reimburse and how this is going to be put into the healthcare system, really. Mm -hmm. So I can't answer to because it will be different in different countries, but we will definitely do a joint effort to make it happen as quickly as possible if it if the results are positive from this trial. Yeah, and I think we'll all hear about it as well if, if the results are. are... We will hear about it the second <laughs> it's being, you know, uh, published, like. yes. Uh, hmm. Another question. Um, my wife has the same story. She is negative, but her brother, sadly not. She has been the one in her family to step up to look after her mother and cousin. Now her brother expects her to help, but she is worn out from the pressure of her cousin dying. How can I help her not to feel obligated to him? He needs help, but there are others. Yeah, I don't know. How can he help her? It's, I don't know, maybe show this webinar and, and here I am. I had to turn down my sister and let her over to others because we have to, the, the, we can't. That's what's also special with Huntington's disease. It's not one person being sick. It's, it's 50%, you know, so it's so many and we... The ones who are left, we have to take care of ourselves and we we have the right to not always be stepping up and, and because it's hard. It's yeah. hard for so many reasons. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I think that might be the questions. John, I don't know if you're seeing other questions there. I, there's, there's, I hope I'm. Yeah, Patricia, there's, there's one more question I can see in the chat. Um, which starts off, um, should I just ask it? Um, yeah, thank you. It, 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 just while I'm asking it, I'm, I'm just going to run a poll as well as we we'll come to the end. So I'll pop the poll on and then I'll ask the question. Um, it's just a poll read to, to find, to get a little bit of feedback about tonight. So, so the question that we've got in the chat says, from your experience, uh, what would you say has helped people to live the best of their ability with HD? I definitely think that sharing with somebody, not all families can share because <laughs> we are many dysfunctional families in HD, but, but if you can within your family, it's a good thing. If not, find friends, some close friends. You don't have to share this with everybody. Some do, and that's fine. But I had just a few friends I shared with and then my, my partner and my husband later, I could share it with. Because if you deal with it alone, um, it's it's harder. And for me to be associated with the community and the association has been amazing. Uh, and, and so, uh, as I said, therapeutic and helpful and supportive and everything. And I really feel, you know, we are many who talk about the extended HD family and it's a true concept. We really feel so connected, like family members. We truly, truly love each other, and it's so, so good to have each other. Yeah, I think that there's actually one more thing, and I don't think we've had this question. So, what changes have you seen in the community and how it copes since you first found out about HD, which ties in a little bit with what you've just said? Yeah, so definitely, I think I started to say a little bit about that. There is more people being transparent and open and sharing. 
but still it's the it's it's very very common that families and member family members feel it very hard to share and deal with things alone so there is more open openness about it and there is more support there is so it's 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 building up there are much more good you know people healthcare providers now in different in different professions who are able to provide some support and there are much more resources out there and there are so many more options now through through the internet to connect with others and to feel part of a community so so definitely today is much better much better than 30 years ago and we will continue to to improve and and make things you know better for more people thank you thank you very much um yeah i see one or two thanks there as well astri um people saying that they really appreciate you sharing your personal account and um another one thank you for a, a fantastic talk um Astrid, thank you so much for sharing uh, your story. You are a great storyteller <laughs> and I could listen to you for much longer. Um, and then another one, thanks so much, Astrid, and all really enjoyed this and appreciate you taking the time. Astrid, thank you so much for sharing your wonderful story. Take care. Um, and another thank you so much. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of thanks coming in. Yeah, thank you so much, all of you. It's it's been a pleasure to be here, and I'm happy if I can share and and people can recognize something. And uh, and we all have different stories, but we also share a lot. So it's been it's I've really enjoyed it. So thank you, Patricia, and and, and thank you all for for having me again. It's been it's been a pleasure, really. I'm just, I think sorry I'm just noticing Patricia something in saying it would it be available online yes yes it will I think if you um, you might have missed at the beginning it just said that it'll be on the Huntington's Disease Association YouTube channel and it'll be on the Irish um website. website and the Scottish website as well so it's it's available lots of lots of places um yeah, we will share it also, uh, at least a link for at uh, the European Huntington Association webpage. So we will yeah. share. Yeah. Great. And somebody there, Astrid, is, is thanking you for holding them up at the HDO Congress. So I don't know what that's about. <laughs> that sounds like another story. <laughs> OK, what was that holding them up? <laughs> holding me up. Yeah. Oh, uh, okay. Sure. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yeah, I really enjoyed the conference. So that was nice. Yeah. Um. I'm aware we've, we've sort of run over a bit, little bit run over our time. So thank you for everyone for for, for sticking with us, and just to, to say thank you both um, to Astri for that that great talk. I think you know, and for talking so personally, uh, yeah. that, that that means a lot uh, to people. And also thank you to Patricia for uh, for being um, the host tonight, and um, and also behind the scenes we've we've got Rasheen Needy from the the Scottish Huntington's Association. Um, um, and, your, and yourself, John. <laughs> I'm also, yes, I'm from. I, I, I did, I'm, I'm from the, the English and, and, and Welsh um, Huntington's Association. So yeah. So um, I, I think. No, I will try to finalize this with this uh, gratitude day. Uh, oh right. Full of uh, love and gratitude. So thank you, everybody. That's lovely. Yeah, I'm. I'm. I'm not. I'm not doing as good as you. <laughs> I, 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 I don't think I'm going to. I'm not going to attempt that. I don't think. <laughs> okay. Good night, yeah. everybody. Thank, thank you. Good night.